Please open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. And if you stand, I'll be reading verses 34 through 40. Yet again, as we continue and rejoice in looking at the commandment that we have to love. And what better time of year than to be studying this particular command as the love of God was embodied in his son to come and be born and to live and to die and to rise again. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36. Teacher, or excuse me, verse, verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Please be seated. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made where every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. What if I told you that the entire Bible could be boiled down to one word? Well it can. And that word is love. Now the claim that we'll discuss this morning, the claim from scripture that the love of God and love of others provides for the fulfillment of every command and principle in the Bible is radical and life-changing in the extreme. However, it's only meaningful if we understand and live out a biblical definition of that love. So yes, the entire Bible can be boiled down to one word, love, but that one word requires the knowledge of the entire Bible to make it meaningful. One word, love, one Bible to explain it, or believing it and living it out is what makes it truly the greatness of God expressed. What we'll see this morning is that Jesus is the king, whose person and work provide the power to love through which all the teaching of scripture can be understood and obeyed. Again, Jesus is the king, whose person and work provide the power to love through which all the teaching of scripture can be understood and obeyed. Love is the fulfillment of of the scriptures. Now in Matthew 22, we're in the middle of a long week of Jesus as he prepares, as he goes to the cross, as he dies for us, as he displays his love. And we've really stalled out, I guess, as it were on Tuesday, this long day of ministry where, he, where Jesus is really responding to the challenges to his authority. And he's responding to those challenges by silencing the religious leaders over and over again, by really condemning them for their refusal to bend the knee to him. But really, fundamentally bound up in, in one thing. They refused to love him. They did not love Jesus because they did not love God. And although they quoted that mantra, really that scriptural truth every morning, most of them I, from Deuteronomy chapter 6, that behold, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Although they quoted that truth, they didn't live it. They didn't understand it. And therefore, they didn't recognize or love the Messiah when he came. They didn't understand, understand the scriptures. They didn't understand the power of God. And therefore, they didn't understand love. And of course, our world stands in that place today. They don't understand the scriptures. They don't know who God is. They don't understand his power. And therefore, all claims to love fall short of true biblical love. And in the season where love is to be celebrated, where every song is about it, warm, comfortable feelings of love for family and friends and even for deity... We have to understand what it truly means. And that's what the Pharisees actually were asking Jesus. What's the one thing? What, what, what do we need to know above all else? Well, well, this is it. Jesus tells them, you need to love the Lord your God and you need to love your neighbor as yourself. So we're in the middle of Jesus' answer to their most important question that everyone should be asking. And my prayer is that that's what you'll be answering everybody this year, whether they're asking it or not. That is your answer will be, you need to love God and love others. Well, I didn't ask that. Well, that's the answer. At Christmas time, as you work your way up to that, all the time, 
The issue is, what's the one thing you need? And the one thing you need is love. Unfortunately, that's too often used as a cliche. It's too often used without the proper understanding. So I've been going over and over a biblical definition of love, which the word itself, right, this agape love, this, this Greek word that's used, is unique in, in Scripture in that sense. It always refers to the love of God. But the word itself doesn't contain the definition. It's Scripture that defines it. So the word is used in particular contexts, and as we unpack those contexts throughout the Word of God, that's how we're going to understand what the word means. You can't just say it. You can't just say it's the love of God or it's the, the love of others. It has to have content. And that content has to be properly scripturally fulfilled. Otherwise, we are not living out this one command. Really, two commands bound up in the first. First and foremost is to love the Lord your God, and then the second is like it. It flows directly out of it. So I've continually kept this definition before you. My prayer is that you will continue to keep it in your mind so that when you say that you love and when you are seeking to love God with all your heart and soul and mind, that you know what you're doing and that you never forget it, that it drives you because it's the one thing. And really, unfortunately, in our pursuit of theology, somehow, because love has been so misused, because maybe liberal theology has claimed it and the world says it all the time, we somehow backed off from talking about love. As if somehow God is less than that, or if we just say that God is that, that we're, we're doing him an injustice. How could we? That's what Scripture says. The issue is we haven't known the Scriptures. We haven't known the power of God. And even Christians too often use love flippantly or foolishly or without true biblical content. So we've said that we've loved the Lord our God, but we don't really know what it means. We've said that we've loved others, but we haven't filled it in with the proper biblical content. So again, by way of review, and I make no apologies here. I'm going to continue to review it, and I'll probably just throw it in an outline here, you know, every, every couple, time, couple times per year, just to throw it in there. You got, did you remember that? Because this is the one thing. You shall love the Lord your God. The object of love whom? The God of the Bible. Yahweh, Adonai, Elohim, the covenant-keeping God, the eternal, pre-existing God, the one who keeps his covenant of love with his people, the one who rules the universe, the one who spoke it into existence, the one who holds it together by his very power, the one true God of scripture is the only object of love, the only primary object of love. The comprehensiveness of that love is with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and I hope that's been encouraging to you to be reminded that only Christians can do that, but that every Christian does do that doesn't give us excuses to not do it fully. doesn't give us excuses to continue on in sin so that that love is not being more carefully and, and, and powerfully expressed. But if you're a Christian, this defines you. It's who you are. And that may, again, have been part of your problem, may yet be part of your problem. That you're like, no, that doesn't define me. You may not know Christ. But every believer can and does love God with every part of them. Why? Because every part of you has been changed. And then our goal is just simply to burn away the sin through the sanctification process that God provides so that that love is ever increasingly fully expressed because the Spirit of God has not stopped loving. Within you, the Spirit of God is loving God the Father fully, loving God the Son. It's only our sin that keeps that from being expressed more continually through us. And, and do we not look forward to the day when that sin is burned away and that love can then be expressed fully? The love that's always been there, you're not going to drum it up out of yourself once your sinful self is removed. The love is there. We're seeking to see that sin burned away so that this comprehensive love will be more completely lived out. But this is who you are. And then the definition that we've been over and over, the Holy Spirit empowered delight to have an intimate relationship with God through Christ by humbly doing everything commanded in Scripture to glorify Him. It's, it's saying the same thing. To love God is to glorify God. That's what Jesus said. I've, I've glorified you, Father, here on earth so that I might respond to the love that you had for me from before time began. I've glorified you. I've displayed your glory to your people. And I'm going to one day return back to you so that you can then demonstrate or, or reveal again my glory because of the love that you have for me. To say we are glorifying God means that we are loving him because he deserves and requires all glory. So it is to glorify him and to find our full satisfaction in him. Again, you can't say that you love God when you are being fully satisfied or when your highest satisfactions come from something other than God himself because that would mean you love something more than him. 
That's what that means. So if your satisfaction is found in other places to a greater degree than it is found in God himself, then those loves are higher loves and they have to be subordinated to the love of Christ. We are finding our full satisfaction in him and yet where else could you find it? As though that is some sort of, sort of uh, you know, that command is, is onerous to us. How could that be? It's the greatest possible command because you can't find your satisfaction in anything else. He is the only one in which you can find satisfaction because that's how you were built. Your very soul, your very inner man was created to find satisfaction in God alone. So be, to, to be commanded to do that is the best command you could ever hear. You will spend your life trying to find satisfaction in something else and you will fail. So why not live out this definition of love, pursuing biblically what it means to find your full satisfaction in him, regardless of the sacrifice necessary. I mean, how is it a sacrifice in one sense? If you laid everything down to find the fullest of satisfaction in the God of the universe, what kind of sacrifice would that really be? None, except your sinful self except the sacrifices of our foolish selfishness. And if you're burning that away, it's not a sacrifice. It's, it's a tremendous privilege to burn away yourself. Regardless of the sacrifice necessary or what we might receive in return, that is, we aren't simply doing it so we can get stuff back from God. We're doing it because of who he is, his character and his nature. And we do, by his grace, receive everything in return. Everything. As you lay your life down, he provides all. And then you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The similarity of love. The second is like it. Why? Because when you have the first, you must have the second. You cannot have the second. You cannot have love to neighbor unless you have love to God. So never reverse those. And certainly never go all the way to what is sometimes called the third commandment. That is love your neighbor as yourself. And reverse everything by saying love yourself first. And then you can love God and love neighbor. No, it is love God first and foremost. When that is true, there will be, must be a love for others that's expressed. And that's one of the primary ways that you know if you love God. Are you truly loving others? But again, that's why it's so important to know what love of others looks like because you might think you're loving others and you're not at all. You're being kind and nice and patient and tolerant and all of these things, but it isn't for the purpose of Christ. It isn't that God would be glorified and honored in their lives. It isn't that they would be conformed to the image of Christ. It's to make you comfortable or to make your life better or, or, or to build your life around yourself, whatever it might be. So love to God always will result in love to neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Everyone. Every single person on the planet is ultimately your neighbor. That's a pretty, pretty big neighborhood. And yet this is your neighborhood. And amazingly enough, and ever increasingly in our society, you can actually reach people across the world. I mean, literally, you can have conversations face-to-face -face with people that live 5,000 miles away. It's unbelievable. And so the world has really gotten smaller. Our neighborhood, in one sense, is more easily accessed. And yet all of these are your neighbors, everyone who needs mercy and who needs compassion. So there is no one that you can walk by and say, that person doesn't need to be loved. There's no person you can Twitter or text or Facebook that doesn't need to be loved. There's no person you can think about in this entire world that doesn't need to be loved. That's your neighbor. It's everyone. It begins with those closest to us. It begins with the body of Christ and it extends out to every person in the proper mode or manner of relationship that God has dictated. Not everyone has the same depth of relationship with you. Sometimes a relationship is established through a single sentence or a couple of words, but nonetheless, those are your neighbors to whom you desire to pour out the mercy and compassion of God. And then our definition, what is love to neighbor? The Holy Spirit empowered delight in relationship with another, which causes us to humbly obey every command of scripture so that they would be continually conformed to the image of Christ regardless of the sacrifice necessary or what we might receive in return. Love is supernatural, Holy Spirit empowered. It is only as he changes your heart. It's relational. That is, we long for relationship. It's our desire. It's our joy and delight that we would be close to people. Again, as close as we possibly can be in a relational sense because that's what we were built for. It's selfless and humble. It's not self-love. It's not you have arrived. It's that you in relationship to God are what? Nothing in that sense. Valuable in his sight, valuable as his creation, but that your love to self disappears and your love to God then flows out to love to others. It's selfless and humble, it's obedient. It must be. Love must always obey the commands of Scripture because that's the only way to glorify God. And those very commands are the reflection of his character and nature. And you can't possibly love someone else if you aren't living out the character of God. If you've gotten a, a misunderstanding of the law of God that you don't know what it truly is, and we're going to talk about that this morning, then you misunderstand what love is. 
As though love weren't obedience, love weren't obeying the commands of Scripture, that it's some other thing. Well, what other thing would it be? Who's going to define it? So it is obedient, and then, of course, it's scriptural because the only things we're supposed to obey are the commands and principles of Scripture. That's what you're called to obey. Not the inner urges of your own heart, not the dictates of your society, not the demands of your family. You are called only to obey the commands and principles of Scripture and to obey them all the time. So it's obedient, it's scriptural, it's Christ-centered. This is only possible because we know and, and love Christ, because we understand by the power of the Spirit of God, His value, His character. The moment love moves off the person of Christ, it ceases to be loved, which is why no unbeliever ever loved, because no unbeliever loves Christ. They can't. It's impossible. It's whole, it's Holy Spirit empowered. It's supernatural. And so it's Christ-centered from beginning to end. We focus on Christ. We love Christ. He's, his, his character and nature are, are, the, are the content of our love. And of course, it's Christ-conforming. Love must be Christ-conforming because every person's highest good at every point in their life is to be conformed to the image of Christ. In order to do that, they have to come to know him. And as they come to know him, then their only good is to continue to look like him. And why is that that their greatest good? Because when they look like Christ, then Christ is exalted to the highest place. And that is every person's highest good for Christ to look great. That's why you were created. That's why you were built. Yes, to find the fullness of your satisfaction in him alone. Why? So that he would be seen to be the greatest. Do you see how, how totally consuming the person and work of Christ is when it comes to love. That's the travesty of what the world has done. It has sucked Christ out of love. That's what the liberals did. They, they sucked Christ out of it. It became doing nice things and, and, and helping people out and having warm, fuzzy thoughts towards people and being affectionate towards them. Everything but Christ is what love became. Even using Christ only as an example of love, not as person, his work, his character, as as holy God, and his sacrifice, and its atoning, substitutionary nature, just Christ as as an example, as a really good guy who did really nice things, and, and ultimately laid his life down. It's removed all the content from the person and work of Christ, removing the theology of who Christ is, and his full deity, and full humanity, and full substitutionary sacrifice, removing the theology removes love. And that's what the liberals did. That's what the world does. Well, you can have Christ, but you can't have the theology of Christ. You, have to, you can say the name of Christ. You can, you can hold him up as some kind of great example, but you can't teach theology about him. That would be too much. No, you have to know it. If other people are to be conformed to the image of Christ so that he might be seen to be the greatest, you're going to have to know who he is, what he's done, the nature of his sacrifice. Otherwise, it can't be love. Love is Christ conforming. Love is sacrificial Indeed, we lay our lives down. Jesus laid his life down by dying. We most often lay our lives down by living. And we live for others. We live to, to display to them the reality of the sacrifice of Christ. Our lives are a sweet aroma of his sacrifice as we lay our lives down for others. And this love is freely offered. We sometimes call that unconditional, but it's not a great word. Because as we've already seen, love is constantly conditioned by Scripture. And yet it is freely offered. It is offered without there needing to be any merit on the part of the one that you are seeking to love. And it's offered without receiving anything in return before you receive anything in return. And it continues to be offered when nothing is given in return. It's the nature of love. This is a love the world knows nothing of. This is the love that the church displays to the world that transforms it. This is the love that Christ embodied, the love of God. This is the love of the Trinity from before the beginning of time, expressed in Christ, then expressed in us, and expressed through his church to a world that can't see it anywhere else. No other religion, no other person, no other concepts can present this Christocentric, Bible-ocentric, saving love. Only the church. I hope that encourages you. I hope that strengthens you to your task and strengthens us to our task. No one else can do this. You can say, well, the, the Mormons are doing it and the Jehovah's Witnesses are doing it by being nice and the Buddhists are doing it. Of course you cannot say that. They do not and cannot love. Only the church can love. And so we had best do it best be busy about this love because no one else will do it for us. 
And Christ is here on this earth in the form of who? Us. He was here. He did perfectly display and accomplish all the work of love that he needed to, but then he left the task to us. I think sometimes we wish, oh, just come back, Lord, and, and you do that. Why didn't you stay and do that? Because you're a lot better at it than we are, right? But he said, I gave you my spirit so that you could do this work. And I gave you, I built for you, I'm building for you my church. You understand the importance of the church when it comes to love? You can't love without the church. You can't love without the strength of the body of Christ. You can't love you, you, fully and completely. And so he says, I gave you all of these things. I gave you my word, perfect and complete. See, we have the full canon. We're the only, in these last 2,000 years, we're the only people ever in the history of the universe that have had the fullness of the completed canon of Scripture. That is all the books, all the instruction on what love actually is. We've been given that along with the Spirit of God. And so we have this precious privilege to be able to display the reality of what Christ has done. And last week, we, at the very end, we spent some time looking at the display of love, which was the cross, and then we had communion. There's no human example that can be given. There's no human being, no purely human person who can ever love like Christ did because he was fully God and fully man. And his love on the cross, remember, was not a demonstration of ultimate affection. That is just simply liking people, caring for people, being compassionate and desiring to show us an example of what it would mean to be really nice, to really care, and therefore go to the cross. No, the cross is a demonstration of love because Christ purposed it for a sacrifice that would accomplish our salvation. Jesus' love to God was displayed upon the cross. So there's, there's really two loves displayed when we look at the cross. Not simply God and, and the Father's and really the Spirit's love for us, but first Jesus' love to God. Remember that. He said, God, I want to, Father, I, I'm giving you glory as I do this. I'm obeying you as I do this because this is what you gave me to do and yet I'm doing this so that I can show your greatness and glory to men by calling out, by, by bringing to myself, by winning all of those whom you've given me, this redeemed humanity that stands now as the bride of Christ that brings exaltation to Christ and then therefore exaltation back to God because he's the one who designed and built that whole plan to win that redeemed bride for his son, that his son would look great so that he, God the Father, would be glorified. That's the first love of the cross, the love of the Father to, excuse me, the love of the Son to the Father. And then there is certainly the love of the Father and the Son to us. If the cross does not accomplish the work of redemption, if the cross, if the purpose of the cross and the nature of what Christ did on the cross are no more than simply a, a sacrifice to look at, then they're not love at all. 1 John 4, 9 through 10. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world. Why? So that we would live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Sent his son to be the propitiation. That's the love of the cross. Not simply an amazing example, but a true substitutionary, wrath-bearing, glory-giving sacrifice. And even theologians in our day and age are working hard to suck those things out of the cross to make it something less than perfectly and purely Christ-centered, Bible-centered. So we saw the nature of the substitutionary sacrifice and the, and the redemptive sacrifice, paying the price, the propitiatory sacrifice, bearing God's wrath, the forgiving sacrifice, removing the penalty of our sin the life-giving sacrifice, putting in the place of our death, the life of, of Christ, ultimately. A righteousness-producing sacrifice, that is justification. He counts us worthy of, of salvation because we have been credited with Christ's own righteousness. That's what that, sac that's what that sacrifice produced. A glory-giving sacrifice. I mean, John 17, 22, one of the most amazing verses in all of Scripture. The glory you've given to me, I've given to them that they may be one just as we are one. So we receive the very glory of God, not that we become him or somehow become deity, but his glory is, is ex dis displayed and expressed in and through us. And we receive the privilege of the fullness of relationship with him in a relationship-giving sacrifice. This eternal life is relationship with God. And so in that final review, then Jesus give, so I've reviewed it, and I've done that purposely, because now Jesus makes a final statement in verse 40. 
So if we know and understand what love is, then this statement in verse 40 makes sense. If we don't understand those things that I've just reviewed and described, then this makes no sense, or it will make only worldly sense. So Jesus says, here's the two great commandments. Really, the, the greatest commandment, the second is like it, it goes along with it, the two have to come together. And on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. This is a powerful and comprehensive statement. The whole law and prophets means the entire Old Testament. Every command and every principle from Genesis to Malachi. Everything is bound up. Everything depends on these two commands, on these two principles. So when he says the law and the prophets, it's all of Scripture. The wisdom literature is bound up in that. That's the way often the entire Old Testament was described. Law and prophets. What Moses said and then everything else. Right? That's in there. And then he says, depends. This is a strong word. So it's translated depend. Almost everywhere else in Scripture, most of the time it's used, it's used to hang something on. And kind of, in the, I suppose, a negative example, it's used for hanging people. What's the idea? That as they hang from a rope, all of their weight is on it. That's the idea. That's this. It's a very strong word. Everything is weighted down or, or is, is hanging on this. So the word depend is about the best that they could do, but it's much stronger than that. It's really the sum total. It's the foundation of it. It's what holds all of this together. Everything depends on this. Everything in the Bible depends on love. So you thought I was overstating it at the beginning maybe, but I couldn't be because that's what Jesus just said. Everything in the Bible depends on love to God, which is directly related to love to neighbor. Now notice, Jesus did not say that on these, or these two commandments do away with the law and the prophets. They annul the law and the prophets. They replace the law and the prophets. He didn't say any of those things. He said, depend. He said, it all hangs on this. So we're going to have to understand what this actually means. Jesus himself does not flush it out here. He simply says it. He states it. That everything depends on the proper understanding and exercise of these two commandments. So a a couple of quotes might help you here, and then we're going to jump to a Bible passage and spend the rest of our time there. Grant Osborne wrote an excellent commentary in the Pillar Commentary series. He says, this language is fulfillment language, that these two, these two commands complete and bring into fulfillment all of Scripture. Nothing less, he says, than a hermeneutic program for the understanding and application of the Law and the Prophets. You want to know how 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 to interpret the Law and the Prophets? You're going to have to do so through love of God and love to neighbor. In other words, following God in every area of life flows out of love for God and then makes it possible to love others, which itself is the basis for all relationship and ethical living on earth. That's Osborne. Now, R.T. France, who wrote another excellent commentary uh, uh, on on the book of Matthew, says, by contrast, the two texts chosen by Jesus are together sufficiently strong to bear the weight of the entire Old Testament. It does not mean, as some modern ethicists have argued, that all you need is love, right? That's what you've heard. Well, that's what I said already this morning, right? All you need is love, but I don't mean the same thing they mean. When your ethicists tell you, when your, when, when your worldly friends say, look, all you need is love, when the songs tell you, all you need is love, we mean two totally different things. So he goes on to say that, he says, the ethicists argue all you need is love so that one can dispense, here's why they do that, one can dispense with eth- ethical rules out of the law. It's rather to say that those rules find their true role in working out the practical implications of the love of God and neighbor on which they are based. Far from making the law irrelevant, therefore, love thus becomes the primary hermeneutical principle for interpreting and applying the law. We've used that word twice, hermeneutical. We're going to understand and be able to be able to interpret Scripture when, as we are working through and understanding what it means to love God. So now... In order to flesh this out, let's look at Romans chapter 13. Remember, the epistles are the interpretation of or the explanation of the Gospels. What Paul says, what Peter says, what James says, what John says, these are not their own sayings. These are really ways that the Spirit of God uses for us to understand the things that Jesus just says and then moves on. He says everything depends on these two commands, all the law and the prophets. Well, Romans 13 will help us, verses 8 through 10, understand what that means. Romans 13, beginning in verse 8, it says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. 
For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, and therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So first we see from this really explanation of what Jesus told us in Matthew 22 and in Luke 10 and other places, is that love is our primary obligation. Love is our primary obligation. Notice the text. It says, Owe nothing to anyone except to love. He's just been talking about in verse 7, Render to all what's due them, tax to whom tax, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. There's certain debts you've got to pay to people. And when they come due, you pay them, and you pay them in full. When the the government comes and says, Here's your tax bill, you go, Okay, I'm going to pay that. You've got a loan out, and they say, Look, it's time to pay it. You pay it. This has nothing to do with never taking loans. It's all about that when something comes due, you pay it fully. But there's one thing that you can never pay fully. And in fact, it remains your debt and obligation as long as you live in what's that? Love. So you can't ever. Your family member comes in. Your your daughter comes in. And 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 they're asking for something. My debt to you is paid. I've loved you fully. And so you may leave now. Right? Your, your, your friends who have been bugging you, those neighbors that you just can't stand, and you've been doing all that you can, and finally go, done. My, my, my obligation to you is full. I've loved you as much as you need to be loved. Finished. No, this verse says love is always owed. You're not doing some wonderful thing to people. Oh, I'm loving you. How, how sacrificial. Now, again, love is sacrificial. But we tend to view it as, I've done this incredible thing, this great thing. You owe me because I loved you. The Bible says it exactly opposite. I owe you. You owe everyone. They don't have to earn it. They don't have to deserve it. They don't have to do anything to get it. You owe everyone in the world the fullness of your love all the time. Wow. That's what it means. On this, these two commands, depend the whole law on the promise. You're not doing anybody a favor. See, we tend to think that. Look at a favor I did you. I loved you. Paul says, no, yanks that right out from under you. Well, pay him every other debt. Sure, it's full. I don't owe you any more money. Great. (laughs) The bank comes, finished. But you still got to love the guy at the bank. That that obligation is never done. You got to love the IRS, the guy, when he comes and he says, no, you owe me more. And you pay it, and then you say, but my love debt is not paid. You got to love your child when he walks away and he leaves your home and he hates you and shakes his fist at you and says, I hate my upbringing. You continue to love. That's what you owe because they can't ever earn it. So love is your primary obligation. Owe nothing to anyone except to love. Well, maybe put that up in your home. Maybe stick that one on your wall. Maybe put that on your phone. Next time you struggle to love and you wonder, do I have to love and why am I loving and maybe I've loved enough. Owe nothing to anyone except to love. All your other debts paid in full. This one can never be paid in full because there's an infinite amount of love that can continue to be dispensed because this is the love of God. Origen, old old dead guy, old church father, said this, so Paul, Paul desires that our debt of love should remain and never cease to be owed, for it is expedient that we should both pay this debt daily and always owe it. That's what God has given you. And when he died for you, He fulfilled, by the way, his love to you. He will continue to express it, but he loved to the end. He loved to the fullness. And so he said, here, I've given you this debt. You don't owe anything to me in that sense, right? I've I've paid the price, but now I've put you in obligation to every other person in the world to love them all the time. So owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. And, And you might consider, is there anyone on your list this Christmas, anyone in your life this Christmas, anyone in your life that, that has ever been in your life that you said, I've fulfilled the debt, I've loved you enough, I'm done. I don't need, no, you didn't, probably didn't say it that way, but that's how you're living towards them. I'm done. My debt was paid. It isn't. It's the nature of love. So love is our primary obligation. That's what Jesus means when he says, on these two commands depend the whole law and the prophets. This is always your motivation. This is always what you do. This is always what you owe. That never ends. And it's not even going to end for all of eternity. Think about it. We're going to love one another for all of eternity. It doesn't end when we get to heaven. I've loved people enough. No, you're going to continue to love them. You're going to continue to deepen in love for them for all of eternity. Imagine that. And that love can actually increase in depth 
and in character for all of eternity because we're not the Trinity. You're not infinite. And so you will continue to grow and deepen. That excites me. I hope it excites you. Because my love is weak and it's shallow. And I would love an opportunity for all of eternity to be able to practice it without sinning, without sin holding me back. Wouldn't that be incredible? It would and it will. You owe everyone all the time this debt. So next, love provides the motivation and power to obey the principles of the law. So what Jesus means is that we owe it to everyone. This is a debt that has to be paid out continually because it was, we were, were obligated by Christ for this debt. And then next, love provides this motivation and power to obey the principles of the law. That's what it means that all of the law depend on, on or that the the law and the prophets depend upon love is that it's the motivation that enables you to actually live them out. Still, again, back in our text. So he says, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Right? Except that debt of love that we owe to them. Then he goes on to say, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled, not set aside, not abandoned, not ignored, but has fulfilled the law. So when you love your neighbor, when you are expressing this motivation, when you are desiring to see them conform to the image of Christ, when the supernatural work of God is flowing through your heart, then you actually do everything that the law commands. But you cannot do it. You don't have the motivation and you don't have the power unless it's love that's driving it. Unless it's love to God, a, a, a recognition of his glory, of his greatness, having believed that truth, his love for you, having that love then flowing through you. Without this, you couldn't ever fulfill a command of the law, truly ever. That's why love is necessary. You're not, you might be obeying, but you're not actually fulfilling the law because the law is not just about obedience. The law is, the, is about the heart, the motivation for obedience, the desire. The Pharisees obeyed the law a lot. A bunch of it, certainly externally, nearly all of it. The Apostle Paul said, look, when it comes to law obedience, all the stuff the law says, I'm doing it all. But that, that's, not the, that's not the full requirement of the law. Ultimately, the requirement is the law of the law is that it's done out of love, that it's done with the proper motivation, love to God and, and love to others. It's done with the desire to see Christ look great, so a Christ-conforming motivation, which is what God had for us and we have for others. The law, what, what's the intent of the law? So you might be asking that. What was the law for? And, and so here we're using law how? Well, the commandments and principles of Scripture, those things that are laid out for us that God commands that we do. Law is used in other ways in Scripture. It can be simply the law of Moses. It can be the law as, as given directly to the Israelites in its Old Testament form. That is the the, both this, all the different kinds of laws, the laws in relationship to God, the sacrificial laws, the ceremonial laws, all of that as a code of living for Israel underneath God's rulership. But that's not exactly how it's being used here. The idea here is that, again, any command, any principle, and it doesn't matter then what form that comes, whether it was under the Mosaic law or now under the law of Christ, as it were, under the new covenant, any principle or command of God is to be obeyed. And the power to obey it comes from this motivation to love. So consider the Old Testament sacrifices, the Old Testament ceremonial laws. How were those to be obeyed by Israel? Just simply wrote commandments done externally? Of course not. They were to obey the ceremonial law. They were to obey, that is, the, and to obey their, their civil laws and to obey their sacrificial laws. All of those were to be done out of love. Those commands and principles obeyed during that period of time when that was the, the way the law was coded for them. They were supposed to have done it out of a heart of love to God, which required a heart that was changed, a heart that truly believed God. So even in the Old Testament, that's what, that's what was required and to live out under every command that God had given. Now our commands, our set of commands looks differently. We don't have a sacrificial component. That is where we sacrifice lambs and goats. We don't have a civil component. In one sense, even the moral component, the nature of, of how, it was, how it was described to Israel, what we have are the character and nature of God component. Every command that continues to express his character and nature in the particular time in which we live is to continue to be obeyed. Always the intent of the law was glory and honor to God through right relationship to God and right relationship to others in conformity to God's character and nature as expressed in his commands. That was always the intent. 
and that's the intent of God's law for us now. The highest possible view of the law is, prevented, is presented here. Love does not replace the law. That is the commands and principles of God. It fulfills it. It enables it to be obeyed. It is as the new covenant work described in Ezekiel, described in Isaiah, described in the book of Romans, that new covenant work which is to bring the law internal, which is to give us power and motivation, desire, and to do, the, do so permanently. That is through a permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's the intent of the law of God, that we might love him and love others by fulfilling those principles which express God's character and nature in this dispensation or in this time in which we live. Love motivates true obedience to the law. Thirdly here, love's actions are defined by the commandments of the law. So love gives the power and the motivation as we understand and appreciate the character of God in the power of the Spirit as we recognize His greatness, His beauty, His loveliness, His sacrifice, as we're motivated then for Christ to look great and God to be glorified. That gives us our power. It gives us our motivation. And then the law gives us our content. This is what you actually do. This is what love looks like. He says, Paul says, for this you shall not commit murder. So he says, look, love is the fulfillment of the law. Here's the law. Let's see how it is that love fulfills this. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, it's summed up. It doesn't say, again, it's done away with. It's summed up every commandment of the way that we respond towards others and ultimately how we respond towards God is summed up here. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So every command of the law was given for us to live out towards others, and that is our expression of love. Do you see how important that is? The world has said, when, it, when they say you're just supposed to love, it means they define what love is. Just, you know, love is all you need. Sure, whatever you feel like love is. So they fill in the content. No, love is all you need, and Scripture tells you everything that love actually is, and that's bound up in the commandments of God, His principles to be lived out towards others. Thomas Schreiner says all the various commands of the law are simply expressions of love. Love is the heart and soul of all the commands. So that if one begins to focus on the commands and loses sight of love, then rigidity, casuistry, wow, big word, legalism are sure to follow. Right? Bad stuff, all right, where we just begin to do it externally. Indeed, there are countless situations in life in which no law can be formulated to specify what is exactly the right course of action. Believers pray in these situations that their love will abound, their love will abound in knowledge, and that the principles of Scripture will be applied so that a proper love to people will go forth. Let's read those commands in light of love towards people. Adultery, love perverted using another to satisfy my lust. Murder, love abused in taking another's life rather than giving my life for them. Stealing, love trampled by taking from others rather than sacrificing for them. Coveting, love twisted from desiring the best of others in desiring the stuff of others. You see how that works. That's how love gets applied to each one of those commands. And those commands then fill out, they flesh out what it actually means to love someone. So you can't say, well, you know, I'm, I'm free from commands. I'm free from the law in order to love you. No, the law defines it. My love enables me to actually fulfill the law towards you, every command, every principle. Notice what he says. Not only those, he, he quotes from the second table of the Ten Commandments, right? the second five that have a relationship to other people. And then he says, if there is any other commandment, and there are a lot of other commandments, hundreds of them, thousands of them in the pages of Scripture to be kind, gracious, gentle, humble. I mean, you, they're, 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 they're everywhere. Every other command, not just Old Testament commands versus New Testament commands, not just anything that flows. No, everything, every command that we are given to obey in relationship to others in the time in which we live is the commands that we are to fulfill. So the law gives us the content of what love actually looks like. And then D, love fulfills the intent of the law. Love fulfills the intent of of the law. Verse 10, love does no wrong to neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And, and by the way, you, you might have been wondering, so why does Paul say, when he says, look, this is the summary of all of this, you shall not murder, you shall not covet those things, it's all summed up, every part of the law ultimately can be summed up in you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why doesn't he say it's all summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Well, one, because he's particularly focusing on love that goes out towards others. 
But I, I think it's, it works the same either way because 1 John 4 that we've read multiple times tells us that we can't say that we love God unless we love others. So love to others becomes the litmus test, the scriptural litmus test of whether or not we're actually loving God. So if you want to boil it all down, you just say, are you loving others biblically? If you are, then you love God. It has to be. Those two have to flow. So it's too easy, I think, at times for us to say, well, you know, let's sum it all by saying, you love God. You know, and everybody here says, I love God. No, we need to sum it up by saying, do you love others? Every other, all the time, according to the principles of Scripture. Okay, th then we're loving God. So it gives us our immediate test, and we can't just say, well, I love God. It's a little bit like when Jesus healed the man, the lame man, and said, your sins are forgiven. They said, how? Who are you to forgive sins? And Jesus goes, what's is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, take up your pallet and walk? Well, to just say it, it's much easier to just say your sins are forgiven. Piece of cake. Anybody could do that. How do we know? Jesus is saying, I'm proving to you his sins are forgiven by doing, as it were, the hard thing. Again, harder, more substantial, of course, is forgiving. But in the eyes of the people and what they could see, I'm, I'm causing him to walk. And so I'm demonstrating my ability to do this really harder thing. Well, it's the same thing for you. Your love for others is the demonstration of, as, as it were, the harder thing, the bigger thing of loving God. So Paul says, it's all summed up in that. So you go home this afternoon and you can say, well, am I, am I loving God? And you start to list your relationships and consider the nature of Scripture. And are you obeying everything in Scripture towards everyone that you know? Now, I understand we're not doing that fully. I get that. But remember... You are doing that as a Christian. You do have that ability to love them with all that you are because all that you are has been changed. So you are doing that to some degree. Now the goal is to flesh that out ever increasingly so that your love is greater. Your love is deeper. Your love is stronger. And we know how to do it from the principles of Scripture. It says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. That is, love would never sin against a neighbor. So love, of course, fulfills everything in the law. That's a negative way of saying love only does that which is best, which is another way of saying love only does that which enables another person to know, to love, and to look like Jesus. He's just stating it in the negative. Love does no wrong. Therefore, love always does right. And what is right is to live out these principles so that people look like and know and love Jesus for all of eternity. That's the only ultimate right thing. You feed them, you care for them, you clothe them, you might do all these other things for them. Is that ultimately what is right? No, you would condemn them to eternal hell if you didn't do that for Christ in the name of Christ. That can't be loving. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. And for all of the commands of Scripture on the negative side, no adultery, no murder, no lying, no stealing, but all of the positive commands to love, to care, to be kind, to share the gospel, to lay down your life, to pour yourself out, all of those things. It's the heart, the very nature of the law. No wrong, only that which is right, ever and always. And every sin, every violation of the law is a lack of love. Now, see, I've said that before, now we're proving it. Love does no wrong, no sin at any time, ever. That's the goal, towards a neighbor. And the law was built so that you would know exactly what that was. What a blessing from God to give you this law, to give you his commands and principles. And now, we, again, we have it fleshed out, Old Testament and New Testament, every command now actually given to us. There are no other commands coming. There are no other revelations needed. If there were, you couldn't love people. You, you see how deadly it can be to say, well, Scripture's not enough, or we need something more. In order to love, see, here's what our prophets are telling us, our so-called prophets. Uh, in order to really love people, you have to have some further revelation. No, no. In order to love people, you need to obey the law. You need to do what's here. Everything that's already here, Old and New Testament, every commandment already given. Because if you've got a new commandment coming, something that isn't already in Scripture, we would discard it out of hand. I don't have new commandments coming. Because these are the authoritative set of commandments. You have it all. You have everything you need. We're the only generation that's ever had it over these last 2,000 years. What a precious privilege. So love fulfills the intent of the law. No wrong, always right. Everything that is good and right. And then lastly, love is completed under the new covenant. That is, we had an old covenant, the way the law was codified to Israel. And yes, they were still supposed to obey all of those commands, and they were supposed to do that out of love to God. That's what they were supposed to do. Now, the law itself was not built, that Old Testament codification, 
through in the Old Testament to Israel. It, the law itself was not designed in that form to save. And it really pointed ahead to what? To the new covenant when the law that comes through, flows through the person and work of Christ and the ability then to understand and know what God desires and, and the spirit of God enabling us then to love properly and to live and obey properly. Well, the new covenant now really just fills out and gives us the fullest ability now to actually love. Now again, they could and did love to the fullness that we're supposed to in the Old Testament. They were supposed to do that. And there were those that did by the Lord's grace because it was still the power of the spirit of God that enabled that. But now we have a more complete understanding and a more complete ability. That's what the new covenant has given us. The fact that we now have Christ as our perfect example of love. He was only looked forward to. The the Messiah, the Redeemer, the one who would come, he was looked forward to in shadow. He, He wasn't seen fully. Now we've seen him fully in the person and work of Christ. So we have the perfect example. That's what the new covenant allows us to look into the pages of the New Testament to see this perfect example of love lived, spoken. We have his perfect life and his atoning death. They looked forward in the Old Testament to his atoning death, but didn't have it. It wasn't there. He hadn't come. They had the sacrificial system. It was what was best for the time, but certainly only that which which provided a, a, a covering, but not a true propitiation. And so we now have the perfect, effective, propitiatory sacrifice. Think about it. If Jesus Christ's sacrifice is just an example, well, why why not stick with the Old Testament ones? We could keep doing those over and over and over. So we have an example, a picture every day of what it looks like to sacrifice. No, it, uh, it abolished those sacrifices because it was real. It was true. It was an actual atonement provided for us. So we have that in the new covenant. We have seen it and we then take full benefit from it when we put faith and trust in Christ. That substitutionary, propitiary, uh, redemptive sacrifice given for us. We have then in the new covenant the completed word of God to instruct us on how to love as I just mentioned. No one's ever had that. The new covenant provides that fully. The law of God, yes written on the heart, but written on the heart as it were through the pages of scripture. So everything here then enabled and empowered and strengthened to be understood and lived by the Spirit of God living inside of us. We have the Spirit of God to empower us and guide us in a permanent indwelling which Israel never had and which no one ever had before. Yes, the Spirit was active. Yes, the Spirit regenerated in the Old Testament, but never the permanent indwelling. You had to come and be with Israel. That's why the purpose of that. You had to come and see Israel's God, as it were, in the temple. There was no permanent indwelling. Now we don't go to the temple. We go to people. We are the church. So we have the Spirit of God to empower and guide us in love. And we have the church of God to strengthen us and hold us accountable in love. All of those are the blessings and benefits of the new covenant. That's what it's given to us. The person and work of Christ. The completed word of God. The spirit of God indwelling us. The church of God to strengthen us, to hold us accountable, and to give us wisdom and grace. These are your benefits. And so we really have a greater ability and, in that sense, a greater responsibility to love than anyone has ever had for these past 2,000 years as we've lived after the coming of Christ. And so love becomes for us the perfect bond of unity. For our last passage, turn to Colossians, Colossians 3. Colossians 3. So if we as a church want to know how it is that we should flesh this out, what, what should this look like for us? Well, this is a great... And so we had the negative side given, no murder, no adultery, no stealing, no lying, no coveting. And now we have, as it were, the, the positive side laid out in Colossians chapter 3. And so, verse 12, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, love of God placed upon us to make us holy as his children. Put on a heart. This is the heart you've been given, now you place it on of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Verse 14, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. This motivation to see every other person looking like Jesus, beginning with the body of Christ, flowing out then in evangelism to those that don't know Christ. This binds all of this together. It gives us our true unity because we all want the same thing. We're all doing the same thing, obeying the commands of Scripture so that other people will look like Christ because we long to be in right relationship with them and we long to give God glory 
by their looking like Christ. That's the only thing that unifies us. It's not our, don't misunderstand that passage. It's not your nice actions towards people. Lots of groups have nice actions towards each other. It is the Christ-centered, Christ-focused, Christ-empowered nature of longing for people to be conformed to his image and therefore we live these principles out towards them. That's the nature of love. That's what binds it all together. And there's no other group of people on the face of the earth that can do that. I started there, I end there. The church only can do this. How are we doing? How are we displaying these truths? If the whole law and the prophets, all of scripture depends on love to God and love to others, how are we doing? Are we properly reflecting the nature and character of God as expressed in the truth of the scriptures out to, back towards God and then out towards one another and then flowing out towards the world as a whole? It goes on in those verses to say, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. The way that all of this will happen, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. See, apart from the word of Christ, we can't love like Christ or love to please Christ. Teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father, loving him, giving thanks to him. That, that's what that means. So a couple of thoughts for us as we finish out. First, are you a true Christian? Have you believed the love God has for you in repentance and faith, trusting in Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection alone? Because that's where it all starts. First John says that we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. It's a matter of faith that we believe what God has done. And in doing so, then the Spirit of God transforms our hearts or he, he changes us so that we understand that and then he continually flows through us with the love of Christ. Is your ultimate goal in life to bring glory to God by honoring and valuing Christ and finding your full satisfaction in Him? Or are there still other motivations which are superseding this? Again, we wrestle and struggle to keep that primary. But I, I think as you study your life, as you look at it through the lens of Scripture, you have the ability to know if, if those things are just, they rise up and occasionally they're, they're getting in front of Christ, but that's not your primary desire. Well, if that's true, you're a Christian. You're wrestling and struggling, but you're a believer. But if it ever and always is something else that comes up and has a higher priority than Christ, then you need to repent and believe. Is your highest desire towards others to see them conformed to the image of Christ or to see them act in ways which benefit you? There's a difference. Are you excusing any area of sinfulness in your life which will always stunt your ability to love God and love others well? Any bitterness, unforgiveness, immorality, lustfulness, anxiety, any of them are excusing that, saying, well, I can do that and still love well. You can't. And we look more and more like the world when we allow those sins to dominate us and we can't really love. And people walk in our midst and they go, you're just like me. We're not just like other people. Our love isn't just like others. Our love towards other people is not like any other love. So we can't be dominated by sins. We can't be refusing to deal with them. Is your basic definition of understanding of love something other than the cross? or a deficient understanding of the cross, sucking out of the cross the, the reality of what Christ has done? Do you use love as an excuse not to obey a command of Scripture towards someone? That is, I love you, so I'm not going to do this. I love you, so I wouldn't confront you. I love you, so I'm just going to let that go. I love you. Are you using love, misdefined, to somehow think you are actually doing what is right towards other people? And then lastly, in quality and nature, is the quality and nature of your love personally and our love corporately such that believers and unbelievers who come in contact with us are immediately impacted and enveloped by what true love actually is? Let me say this. I've spent a lot of time with you. That's a joy and a privilege, and I believe this is being lived out. Do we have work to do? We do. Do I believe as a church that this is our passion, that this is our desire, that this is our practice? I do. I'm with you a lot. And, I, I, and I'm amongst you as the body of Christ. I'm convinced this is true. But would it be that our love would grow and it would deepen in such a way that it could never be denied, even when things are hard and difficult, so that the law and the prophets, all of Scripture, would be properly displayed through the love 
that we share through the love that we pour out on one another, back towards God and out towards the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege this morning of being reminded of the nature of love, being reminded of the importance of love, and yet also of being reminded that you are the one who empowers it. You are the one who practiced it. You are the one who displays it. And Father, I pray that as a church we would grow and deepen, that, that our whole understanding of Scripture would be informed through and, and in the love that we share towards one another and that the world would know during this Christmas time that the, the love of which they sing is insufficient without you and apart from bringing you greatest glory. In your precious name.